Okay, we're back. We're live to begin the week here at 10 a.m. on a given Monday. Uh, we're talking about ending the year, and we're talking about what year we mean of the ox and starting the year of the tiger uh, with my co-host Chang Wang and our guests Robert Weber and Richard Yu. Everybody in, in the whole program is a lawyer. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Chang, <laughs> Chang could be... <laughs> Robert is an immigration lawyer and Richard is a litigator. You know, you can always tell. You, if you look carefully, you can always tell. Um, anyway, Chang, can you introduce these gentlemen and tell us the scope of our discussion this morning? Thank you very much, Jay. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, Jay, you are right. Everybody is a lawyer and everybody is an Asian American. So that I, we think that we have this identity is also very important. Thank you for having all of us and I'm very thrilled to have Bob and Richard on board. Bob has been practicing US immigration law for more than 20 years. He has very extensive experience in green card strategy and the citizenship for some of the largest and the most well-known organizations in the world. Uh, before he starting Weber Law Form 2.0 and Bob was an equity partner at a very large general practice law firm where the Chamber of USA has rated him band one in the area of immigration law. He has, in, he has been named a super lawyer and a lawyer of the year by Minnesota lawyers. Uh, just a one quick note, uh, I've been no, known Bob for many, many years. He, uh, he was the chair of our immigration law section and he has been a leader in our community and he has been a role model for many, many immigration lawyers. I'm very honored to know Bob. Richard is my new friend. Richard specialized in uh, employment law and commercial litigation. He uh, went to University of Southern, Cal uh, Southern California Law School, had been admitted into law practice in Minnesota, uh, in uh, California, in uh, federal course, in uh, the federal course in California. He served his clients as a management side defense lawyer, as former CEO of a technology startup. Richard is the best crossover between business and the law. Richard appears very regularly before both federal and the state courts, and he's based in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Welcome on board, Richard and Bob. Thank you, Jay. Uh, welcome, you guys. So let me start out with, uh, with you, Robert. Um, what's the difference between a, an ox and a tiger, anyway? Uh, well, I think we were using that as a, uh, as a symbol uh, of the end of this year and looking ahead to next year. Um, I think most of us are looking forward to next year, uh, 2021 not being um, as much of a change from 2020 as we wanted, especially uh, in the areas that, that I practice in immigration law and I know Richard has seen a lot of uh, dynamic activity in employment law. I think one of the things that we've uh, seen in the last year is how much, uh, even with the vaccine in place, that society still struggles with the pandemic. And in the area of immigration, whereas the private sector and individuals have tried to adjust their lives uh, and to work around some of the limitations, the government uh, continues to have a lot of the backlogs and dysfunctions, which were a legacy of the prior administration. Yeah, well, you know, I, I tend to uh, uh, blame a lot of COVID on Trump. I tend to blame a lot of things on Trump, and I'm right, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and the other part of it is that, uh, you know, here we are, and um, COVID has changed, uh, Trump changed immigration law for sure by being a racist. Um, and then of course, COVID changed immigration law. And you know, I, you know, we talked before the show about uh, giving it up and going home and doing something um, you know, fun at home. Um, maybe you could do think tech shows all day, that would be fun. Um, but you know, the, the bottom line is immigration law has become much more complex, more difficult, your toolkit is less effective than it was. Um, I don't know, how, how's immigration law doing, Robert? It seems to me that it's a challenge now because of those two factors, Trump and COVID. 
That's right. And I think that um, with the election of Biden and now he's, you know, almost into a full year of being president, we had hoped that things would uh, change in a different direction. So if you sort of think of the Trump administration as digging a hole, then to uh, think that we're getting out of the hole. But one of the things that we've experienced uh, as immigration attorneys, and I know Chang has experienced this with his clients, is that things haven't uh, changed as quickly as we need them to change. And I think one of the things is that government uh, moves slowly. And so uh, if, if uh, it's like a battleship, it's sort of facing one direction and Trump got it to move a different direction and now getting it to move back is, is taking time. And um, seeing this in all different places with the filings at the immigration service, uh, at the consulates. So for most of 2021, people were limited in being able to travel and now, as of this morning, some of the travel bans are coming back for some of the countries in Africa. And what we found is that even after the travel bans are lifted, you can't get into the embassy to get a visa in the situations when you need a visa. And it's hard to accelerate that process because of a lot of, uh, a lot of things that have been in place and have been um, you know, uh, impacted by, like you say, uh, Trump and then COVID. And I, I, unfortunately, I think that that's going to continue into the year of the tiger, although I'm hopeful that um, there will be some additional policy innovations to, to facilitate things, because I think we also realize how much the economy has, uh, has suffered and, and, you know, as a result of these, these changes. Oh, sure. I want to talk about that. But one more question before we go to Richard, and, and that is this, you know, we learned things and I don't sometimes the lessons you learn are not really good we learn things about how to deal with um you know people who were dangerous or we perceived to be dangerous to the country by uh, imposing uh, entry barriers um, in in COVID number one I call it COVID number one um and um I don't know if that was really effective but uh, certainly uh, it, it seemed to satisfy a lot of people politically uh, that we, uh, you know, shut down the borders or close to it. And now we have uh, Omicron. Nobody knows what Omicron is like yet. Uh, and, I, you know, I don't think we're going to get a clear answer on that for at least several weeks, uh, if we do. Um, the just, but just the outline of what, what uh, you know, looks like, you know, there are, there are 50 mutations instead of a handful. Uh, as we went from, you know, COVID to COVID-2 was a, uh, just a handful, now it's many times that. And the mutation is what you need to track if you're gonna make a vaccine. So we don't really have a handle on whether the existing vaccines, even including the boosters, will work, okay? And as we go forward, it seems to me that what's in the toolkit is what we quote learned, end quote, um, in the year 2020 and into good part of 2021. So it's likely that governments all around, including the Biden government, which is relatively speaking enlightened, um, is going you know, to shut down the borders. Um, th there aren't cases in Hawaii right now, but there will be, and there will be cases all over the mainland, or cases in Canada, cases, 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 cases. It, it, all you have to do is, is breathe across the border and there are cases there. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to be terrified in a few weeks. What, what is going to happen? I mean, the process is going to be worse, no? Um, and, and this is going to affect immigration law. And ultimately, as you suggested, it's going to affect economies um, because, you know, these days it's all interdependent and the global economy depends on mm, relatively free borders and relatively free entry. Um, what do you perceive? How, what's your level of concern, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is uh, it is hard to sort out uh, how things will uh, develop. I, it may be a possible transition into Richard's area, but we're seeing, of course, work from home, and that work from home concept uh, extends now uh, with with Zoom and other uh, uh, yeah. innovations to work from home in other countries. And so, I think that 
one of the things that we're seeing in immigration, I have more and more clients trying to uh, figure out uh, how to utilize their workers who were in the US but needed to go to India for personal reasons and couldn't come back. And some of that um, may become more permanent uh, and it ties into Chang's uh, comment uh, about the number of people who are, are quitting because they're worried about the vaccine or they're worried about the pandemic uh, the virus. But there's so many cross currents. I think one of the fascinating things is that uh, those of us who support immigration tend to be, um, uh, you know, open oriented, but we also maybe are cons more concerned about the virus than those who uh, would be less oriented to open the border. And so there's these sort of cross currents between uh, these values. And, and, um, and I think that's going to continue. And I think we see it in, you know, employment law and the distinctions between federal in the US here of course we have you know blue states and red states and uh uh and and employers who operate in in both and and trying to manage that and for better or worse US immigration law is federal and so we do have one system one screwed up system nationwide but um uh I know in thank, thank you law, for that adjective robert <laughs> <laughs> let me move on to richard uh, Richard, you know, um, you know, something that Robert said just uh, evoked in me the notion that litigation in this country is different. Uh, the courts are different. They are, um, whether, whether they succeed in this or not is a big question. They are right now the holders of our moral standards are norms. And therefore, every litigator has a, a Every, the role of litigators has changed because you're part of, what do you want to call it, a legal community that in a left-handed way, all in recent years, has taken on a new meaning in the rule of law. Do you agree with that? I do want to say, Jay, first of all, I, I think you make a very valid point over there as to the role of the litigator to the court and to the society in general. Traditionally, we've seen that uh, we all know the U.S. legal system is built upon two parties um, in an adversarial relationship. One side advocates something, the other side advocates another, and somehow you arrive in the middle and the judge makes the ruling at the end or the jury, right? One thing I do want to say, and that's particularly interesting for the year of Ox and going to Tiger next year, is what is COVID doing to this kind of system? And if you or anyone else, you know, in front of the TV watching the news, we know that it's a mess right now for everything relating to COVID from regulations all the way to how the courts are reacting to COVID. For example, right, just a couple of months ago, well, actually less than two months ago, the federal OSHA announced the rule that now there's going to be a national mandate on vaccination. It's called the Vax or text test test. You either do the vaccination or you do a weekly test. After that came out, the first thing you get in the first three days is more than 26 states coming out opposing that rule, saying that's unconstitutional. And now you, and by that time, you're seeing various filings going from district courts to court appeals, you know, different circuits across the country. Then right after that, you see the National Labor Relations Board saying, you cannot enforce that rule unless you first bargain with the unions. And amidst all of these, now, basically two weeks ago, what we have is all the courts are consolidating their cases to the Sixth Circuit. Now, here's one thing that's very interesting, a fun fact to share. The reason that they've chosen the Sixth Circuit is not by you know, jurisprudence in that circuit, but by lottery. They literally put numbers in a hat and drew which circuit would be the one that to rule on these cases. And now we're every the entire country is waiting for the Sixth Circuit to decide whether in governments or federal agencies can enforce this vaccination mandate. What's the culture of the Sixth Circuit? Well, you know, the Sixth Circuit covers a lot of states in the Midwest and is leaning toward the right than the left. 
So it is a, an odd draw for this because on one hand you have national security, right? You wanna talk about people's safety. For example, one of the things we're seeing from various states across the country is a vaccination mandate for healthcare workers. And that's a no brainer, right? If you want to see a doctor, you're seeing nurses, you wanna make sure they're safe and you're safe. So that entire healthcare system is safe. On the other hand, you're seeing the states that are completely against enforcing vaccinations. So it's kind of like an odd draw. I may be leaning toward the right, but we're hoping, and this goes back to your question, Jay, that the courts and the attorneys who are involved in the case will do their job to deliver justice and equality in this, in this issue. To what extent are you doing that in your cases, your appearances in the state and federal courts? Absolutely. That's a great question, Jay. So my job here as a commercial litigator and employment litigator is to advise employers as to what to do. And one of the things we always tell the employers is you have to watch for what the governments are mandating, because if you don't do that, you will be in a violation of the law. So if OSHA, if the Sixth Circuit upholds the OSHA's rule, then not just me, but the entire legal industry or community should be advocating for enforcing that rule. Um, if, on, 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 obviously, um, on the other hand, if the Sixth Circuit, Circuit says you cannot enforce that rule, then the next tier question will be, what is your state saying? Because that's the second question. It's California allowing that rule to enforce because states can always uphold a, level, a higher level of scrutiny on these rules. And for California, the answer so far is yes. Mandates are allowed by private employers. And I'm sure you probably have seen in the Fifth Circuit in Texas, Southwestern Airlines uh, are mandating their flight attendants to get the vaccinations and the Fifth Circuit in Texas have said, yes, that is allowed. Hmm. Well, I think we all have to watch this. You know, they say, Richard, that we're not gonna come out of this. I mean, the notion um, that some courts in this country and possibly at the end of the day, the Supreme Court in this country um, can find that the quote, I say, quote, constitutional rights of people to be anti-vaxxers outweighs um, the 700,000 deaths we have had so far. And I was saying before the show that, the, the, you know, the 93% the, the of the people who are dying from COVID now um, are anti-vaxxers, which I find really, or not vaccinated, that is really remarkable. And if you ask a bunch of people what they think is going to, you know, make this rational again, they, they tell you it's, it's a catastrophe, that you have to have a war, a national catastrophe, a climate change catastrophe, some kind of thing where we are bonded together again, where the social fabric comes together again, where we realize that we do better hanging together than hanging separately. Um, and I wonder if you see that process coming soon or maybe not coming or coming later. Yeah, that's a great question too, Jay. Um, and this is probably where Chen can chime in since he's just traveling back from China where the entire country is acting under one umbrella saying, you know, there's gonna be vaccination and everyone, you need to get vaccinated. You need to have your vaccination codes. Now within the US, given the history we have, it's gonna to be tough, right? We have seen this repeatedly happening under the umbrella of the second amendment. On one hand, you have these mass murders, you have these massacres happening on school campuses. And on the other hand, you have the ones who are advocating for the rights as afforded by the second amendment. And arguments are very feisty going both ways. Now here, under the same umbrella, similar umbrella for the COVID issues, you raised, the, the point that you raised earlier is very valid, Jay, that a lot of times there is no time to waste in an exigent circumstance like this. By the time the Congress or the government has decided which way we should take, probably a lot more people are gonna die. And at the end, the COVID might have ended with a lot of people with lasting results or consequences that they cannot otherwise afford to have. So for to going back to your first question here, Jay, is what are we gonna do as a country? So right now under the Biden administration and within the umbrella uh, of the employment law, we can see that the government's leaning toward mandating vaccination or regularly having tests. We know that for sure. Um, if the Sixth Circuit rules that, you know, this is gonna be allowed, then we may see the first national mandate of all vaccination mandates. But now coming back to you, Jay and Chang, tell us what do you think about China and doing the comparison between various countries? Because I think Chang just mentioned that Japan has closed all its border to foreigners today. Yes, 
You know, uh, Chang, you know, Xi Jinping uh, would, would have told uh, Joe Biden in their meeting a couple of weeks ago that um, whatever the systems are, uh, Xi Jinping's system is better because he can get things done. OK, and, you know, there's a certain amount of resonance because we can't get things done. Sorry. Um, and with all our mechanisms and our rules, regulations, and bureaucracy, uh, we are, you know, what do you want to call it, unable to get things done. So my question to you is, uh, does that resonate? Is that, is that a clear picture? Uh, where are we going on this? Uh, should we be adopting Xi Jinping's approach? Well, Jay, first of all, appreciate you having me on the show to talk about, you know, my travel experience and uh, inviting Bob and uh, Richard to talk, to summarize what we've been witnessing in 2021 and uh, expecting what we're gonna expect in 2022. First of all, I can't comment on anything on the president of China and uh, it's beyond my capacity. And I don't want to uh, uh, comment something. I'm not very, have a very clear picture, but I, I spent 60 days in China recently. I just got back from China 36 hours ago. What I can tell you is people feel safe there. People feel very, very safe. You know, it's, it's, it's parallel universes. It's completely different, different mentality. As Richard said, it's under one umbrella, the uh, it's order and control. Uh, but one uh, uh, quick clarification, uh, they do not mandate vaccine. They strongly encourage it. <laughs> There's a local uh, city uh, mandated uh, vaccine. They check your health code on your mobile phone, whether or not you've been tested uh, negative in the past you know, 48 or 72 hours, whether or not you have any close contact with any suspicious COVID positive case, and whether or not you've been vaccinated. But uh, only lack of vaccination will should not ban you from entering any public facility or public transportation. There was one city, they did mandate that. They changed the color of your health code. And if you are not vaccinated and they've been challenged in court. And finally, the, 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 uh, actually they withdraw that mandate. It's very amazing. But uh, everybody I know, everybody I met for the past 60 days, they've been vaccinated. So the government obviously strongly, strongly encourage it. Back to our situation here. And uh, I win by, I, I, when I arrived in Shanghai Pudong International Airport, I was greeted by health workers and a very strict process, uh, you know, in the first, 28 days, I've been tested 10 times for COVID. And I mean, uh, my body temperature was taken twice a day. It's, uh, it, it's, there is a, you cannot expect anything can be, uh, you know, if there is a COVID positive, okay, there's absolutely no chance you're gonna to spread it in China because the system works so well. But when I return to the United States, and uh, uh, arriving in San Francisco uh, as a trusted traveler, and it took me very little time to go through the US custom and immigration. There was no testing, there was no quarantine, and there was uh, uh, nothing. Uh, I, obviously, I enjoyed it, I appreciate it. But uh, uh, our, there's the individualism versus collectivism. In, in most Asian countries, it's collectivism. They have a collective men's side. Uh, people need to sacrifice their individual liberty. And well, sacrifice. in a world of interdependence. Yeah. Uh, in a world where well, we well, all, there China, are so many of us, and we live so closely. That's um, true, but China locked, effectively locked down for almost two years. And in the foreseeable future, they will continue to lock down because the system, they believe the system works so well. We have, we have, you know, so some kind of lockdown, but it's not really working. You know, when we declared the band, the flights from South African countries, seven of them, and we give like a, a time time limit. We have a, you know, three, five days advance notice according to our system. And also we allow citizens and green card holders to return without any additional processing. But 
if you mean lockdown, they, they do lock down. They, they lock everybody out. Chang, we're, we're, we're going to lose. Uh, we, we're, gonna, we have, we're running out of time. Uh, let me go. Let me go for last comments here. Robert, you know, um, are we going to see more lockdown in this country? I guess we are. But, you know, the problem is if you look if you look at the immigration laws and practices over the over the Trump years anyway, you find that it's highly political, uh, not rational and, uh, and often racist and nationalist. Um, so query, if, if I made you the director of immigration, um, <laughs> maybe if I should, why not? Let's make you president. Uh, what, how would you reform uh, the immigration laws in the United States going forward? Wow, that's a big, uh, that would be a big magic wand. Uh, it would be a great opportunity to, uh, to reform the system. I think it's in need of reform. I think one thing uh, that we have to keep in mind as Americans is that the whole world is struggling with migration issues. There's, a, there's something going on between Belarus and Poland now. There were some people who died very recently in the English Channel going from France to the UK. Uh, immigration, just in the New Yorker, I think in the next issue of the New Yorker, there's a big article about the European Union is paying uh, some thugs in Libya to detain people. So this is not just an American issue, but it's a, it's a struggle on how to humanely allow people who are from uh, countries that are, are struggling to be able to better themselves, but to do it in some sort of organized way. And it just, uh, and I think that we, we don't have a good system for that now. There's clearly more demand than the supply allows for. I'm not sure that we'll end up anywhere near what the system is in China, but I do think technology could play a part in improving things uh, in terms of um, awareness of, of, uh, of options and processing of paperwork, but it's gonna take more, uh, more than the year of the tiger to probably make that happen. Yeah, you know, I, I, not that we can get into this now, but just for a provocation, it seems to me that the United Nations uh, should spend more time and effort trying to determine global immigration and migration policy. It has not been effective in doing that. Uh, but going forward, it seems to me there should be at least a collaboration um, between countries at the United Nations level uh, to generate more equitable immigration and migration policies. Let me go to you, Richard. <clears throat> you know, the American Bar Association really never took a position against Trump. Uh, the American Bar Association is sort of a wallflower on the sidelines. It was a disappointment to see that all these violations of rules and norms, um, you know, happened without without the American Bar Association weighing in. And I feel that the I feel that the community of lawyers, the you know, the bar around the country should be stepping up as we discussed earlier. So my question to you is, um, how do we fix this? We are losing public confidence, with the exception maybe of the Aubrey case. We are losing public confidence in the ability of the courts uh, to generate just results and the appellate courts to generate just opinions and decisions. Uh, how do we achieve new confidence in, in American justice? I might add that on the, on the uh, Supreme Court courthouse at Foley Square in Manhattan, um, it reads, um, uh, the, the true, the, the firmest pillar of government is the true administration of justice. The implication there, of course, is public confidence. How do you feel about that? Well, first of all, Jay, I thought you were going to ask me, what would I do if I were the president? Uh, <laughs> No, no, I'm the president, Richard. You can be the attorney general. I can be the president. I can be the attorney general. That is true. But going after your, your comment and question earlier, Jay, we are seeing that courts uh, at least in the employment realm that's leaning toward progress in this year as well as into the next year. And that's the trend happening right now. We're talking about a systematic wage increase for many states in the United States. And for the first time ever, California is going to be $15 an hour throughout the entire state. Hawaii is increasing to, I believe, $10 and 20 some cents for the next year. And we're, what we're also seeing, it's a systematic increase in the power of workers going forward. And we're not just talking about employment workers, but we're also talking about labor union workers. If you've been following the news, 
you'll see that there's a lot more organizing efforts, strangely, in the last two years when everybody's working remote, because usually that doesn't happen. Usually when you have workers staying at home, being absent, you have a lack of union organizing efforts. But for the last two years, it was not the case. And especially for the healthcare workers, since the 1950s, you have not seen worker sentiments this high and their bargaining powers this strong. And this is not just with one union, but with multiple unions in this country. So going back to your question, Jay, we do see that the system is turning. We do see that the more cases in favoring. And now with more courts being reopened and allowing more in-person vaccinated individuals, in-person testimonies and court hearings, you are seeing more cases being filed into the next year. And that's going to be likely the trend for the year of Tiger. Are you going to be busier going forward, Richard? Do you have a perception of that? I mean, as we move ahead, and these things have to get sorted out, as they get sorted out, a lot of that will be in court. Do you see the role, your role, and the role of litigators around the country as being busier going forward? Absolutely, Jay. Um, so for the year of Fox 2020, uh, we are seeing a check-shaped trend going upward. So we had a dip in the middle of the pandemic because most courts were closed and a lot of people are staying home and they're working remotely. But as more courts are reopening, our policies are coming into effect, we're seeing an upward trajectory, uh, trajectory for more cases being filed. So we are expecting that 2022, it's going to be a busy year. You know, Chang, this all suggests that maybe the year of the tiger is a year for a little optimism. Can you summarize and give us your thoughts about that? Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you, Bob and Richard. We even talk about immigration, travel, employment, and uh, a vaccination for the past 30 minutes. Uh, I just want to emphasize that, you know, as a first, second, gen, third generation immigrants, we are extremely proud of our, our legal system. For us, uh, the law means uh, equal protection, which is one of the top issues in richer specialty employment law, and means due process, which is one of the top issues in Bob's specialty immigration law. And But other country and other culture have different understanding of what the law means. For other uh, cultures, the law base probably means law uh, order and control, and which might in the short term very effective in combat the pandemic. But for us, we, are, we have the, the pandemic exposed some vulnerability, vulnerabilities of our system and even the legal system. But at the end of the day, I think we should all be cautiously optimistic and the year of Tiger is supposed to be a year of big change. And I can only hope it's gonna be changed for something much, much better. Thank you. I'd like to weigh in on that too, but I'm gonna wait till I find out exactly uh, how many mutations the Omicron has. And then I'll give you my, my level of <laughs> optimism or pessimism. Thank sure. you, Robert sure. Weber. Thank you, Richard Liu. Thank you, Chang Wang. It's been Thank a great you. discussion. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show. Thank Aloha. you.